What a fine and wonderful leader we have in you, and we are going to need a lot more of you in the days to come. We have, uh, see, six, seven proverbs maybe this morning. We'll see how far we can get can go and get through them. Uh, we are in Proverbs chapter 18. We are beginning with verse 5. To show favoritism to the guilty is not good, and so denies the innocent justice. Here is 6. The lips of a fool come into controversy, and his mouth cries out for a beating. Seven, the mouth of a fool brings terror to himself, and his lips are a trap for his lips or mouth. They're interchangeable. It's actually lips in the inspired language. We say mouth. One and the same. Here is eight. The words of a slander are like tidbits. They descend into one's innermost being. Nine. Even the one who is slack in his work is brother of him who destroys. Ten. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. A very famous proverb I'm sure you've already put to memory. Eleven, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city and like a high wall in his imagination. Here's the way I'm going to teach and these proverbs and here's what I believe that they are actually saying to us. Uh, verse 5, 18.5, real wisdom promotes fairness and justice. Real wisdom, skill for living, promotes fairness and justice. Actually, I've never done this before, but these proverbs are so similar, I made the application for 6 and 7 to be exactly the same. The vile mouth talks himself into trouble and punishment. The vile mouth talks himself into trouble and punishment. That's for both six and seven. Here is eight. The fool loves slander. The fool loves slander. Nine. To leave work undone is the same as destroying it. To leave work undone is the same as destroying it. Ten. To understand the tower is to know the name. To understand the tower is to know the name. And here is 11. The imagination is not real and does not last. The imagination is not real and it does not last. So here is our exposition this morning, beginning in verse 5. The condemnation of improper judgments in a legal context. This opening phrase, to show favoritism, is literally lifting the head or the face. And notice, it is the guilty. In other words, judicial judgment has already been rendered upon them. When you use the word guilty, it means the gavel has come down. It's not speculative at all. Now the proverb declares the circumstance of what is not good. And what is that? According to the proverb, it's the denying the innocent justice. 
It's not fair. And the issue before the people and the hearing at the gate of the city, the ancient cities, were the people are compromised. And the issue is compromised. Previously, in power, the magistrate, Proverbs 17.23, showed favoritism in exchange for a bribe. In the New Testament, believers are specifically instructed to never show any type of favoritism. That's 1 Timothy 5.21. The Apostle writes, without partiality. That's the way we're to deal with a matter, an issue. Without partiality. James chapter 2. We show in the church no favoritism because someone has money or power. We're all treated the same. We are all believer priests. And there is no hierarchy in the church. I've had this past week, as you can imagine, so many texts sent to me and so many phone calls. What should be my attitude? What should we do? Well, I, I go back to the words of my great professor who preached here many times, Haddon Robinson. Whatever is morally wrong can never be politically right. Isn't that a great statement? What should we do? Here's what we should do as believers. We should pray for truth. We should pray for integrity. Righteousness, says the book of Proverbs, exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any land. So we should pray for the rule of law as it has been established and already written. Not being written today, not written yesterday. It's been written. It's codified. It's there. It's established. And we need to pray not only that, but for our enemies, those who despise us. And there are many that do. They hate the righteous for whatever reason. And we should pray for them. And we should be people whose conduct, as Warren just prayed, is above reproach in everything. Our yes is yes, our no is no, and most importantly, Trust God. And that's our Proverbs today. Now, here is communication in 6 and 7. The lips of the fool. The lips of the fool. Both in 6 and 7. The fool by his mouth intends to damage others. But in so doing, what the Proverbs teach is there's a boomerang here. It falls back upon him. He attempts to cut down the tree, but the tree falls on him instead. This word controversy, strife, dispute, it was used regarding the law of Moses in Exodus 23. See, people didn't like the law. They didn't like the word then, and they don't like it now. Line two. The mouth cries out. Interesting, this word is used of the patriarchs building their altars. We saw it for the first time in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8. Abram pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east, and there he built an altar, and he, here's your word, called. He called on the name of the Lord. But this, this is a different context. So the lexical scholars have translated this different than called. It's rather to require, implying the idea of someone or something needing to remedy a situation. And they do that verbally. That's the idea. So that is how... The idea of calling is involved in this require. 
And so here's the result. Beating, caning, whipping. That's the ancient Near East. Punishment. See, his speech has alienated him from any form of public sympathy. His behavior naturally attracts feelings of hostility. That is the profane speech of our society. It is unseemly, it is unbecoming, and it is straightway wicked. I can remember back, I think it was the 70s, the top of the 70s or right around the 80s, my wife and I went to see one night this movie that everybody said was so spectacular, Raging Bull. We left after about 10 minutes. I said, let's get out of here. Uh, I need a shower. This is filth. That should be our sensitivity to language and speech according to the book of Proverbs. Here's seven. The lips of a fool again. The tongue is a fire, said James. And it is no surprise that over time... And attention in the book of Proverbs, we spend so much time on mouth and communication. The way we speak to one another. The manner with which we speak to one another. And it brings about quarrels, conflicts, rebukes, accusations, gossip, slander. All from the mouth, which comes from the heart. This is the way we are. Here the fool by his mouth is primed for action, bringing harm to others. Our top line says, in so doing, this time, the sovereignty of God invades and overrules him. The mouth that consistently devoured others is the mouth that's going to be devoured. The tree's going to fall back on the perpetrator. Terror, we translated this word back in chapter 10 and verse 14 as ruin. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of fools invites ruin. That's our word terror here. It brings you to the end of yourself and of things. In other words, his criticism was his undoing. Our top line ends with himself. You see that? Like all foolish behavior, he brings it upon himself. His mouth, his lips are a trap, a snare, like an ancient bird trap. The toothpaste is out of the tube. We have heard what you have said. It's there. And you can't take it back. You can't erase it. What comes out of your mouth is from your heart. So Proverbs says the skill is to guard your heart. That's what we should be about. The prayer of the psalmist, put a watch over my lips. Guard my heart. And that's exactly how the Lord sought to correct Cain. He went to his heart. But he resisted. And he murdered his brother. He resisted exactly the way the Apostle Paul says that man resists in Romans chapter 1. He suppresses the truth. You see, God told him the truth about himself. And he didn't want it. And didn't listen. These ancient traps brought death. Consequences from the book of consequences. Pharaoh's own mouth pronounced anger, death to the firstborn of all Egypt. He uttered it himself, and God turned it on him. Daniel's detractors wanted to get rid of him. And so they appealed to the king, and they got him in that little overnight stay in the lion's den. Their mouths brought them Darius's anger after Daniel was survived. 
and into the waiting lions. They were poured into the same hotel with a quite different outcome. There was no angel there to protect them. Here's eight. The words of a slander are like tidbits. Tiny morsels is the way we translate that. They descend into one's inmost being. Here, more bad speech. This comes in the form of gossip. These proverbs appear again in 26.22. It's almost verbatim. The proverb is about controversy. Here's what is the idea. We use phrases like, There's the, wor the word on the street is. Or the word is out. That's these tiny tidbits that we're talking about. Things said that precede the event themselves. This is a type of speech to incite people, alienate them from others. Our top line opens, the word of a slander. It's the word murmur. Murmur. A malicious form of speech that is a sin in the book of Proverbs. Murmur. It's used in Psalm 106 describing Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. The rebellion that would be judged. 106.25 The New American Standard reads, they grumbled. There's our word. They grumbled in their tents. Did not listen to the voice of the Lord. It's our word. Proverbs 18.8 Slandered. They murmured. Notice this little like, a comparison. Comparison to savory food. Line 2, descends. Literally, things swallowed greedily. Now, the word tidbits here in your English translation is really an untranslatable word in the inspired language. So, we put the word tidbits or tiny morsels to it. But it's untranslatable. It's just the smallest thing to devour that has a wonderful taste to it. That's the idea. Line two, it, we descend, we swallow, we take it in. Now, notice the they. That's in all of our English translations. It shows the cause and the effect of the satisfaction, of the enjoyment, of the slander. The joy, better, getting all of it out. Oh, that was so delicious to be able to say all of those things that I've been hiding in my heart for so long. And that's it. That's the sin. The innermost being depicts the deepest part of one's psyche. What's down deep inside. The way we really think and process things. The sin this way. What's well, like the COVID virus. It's so easily spread. There's no mist that we can spray in the air. It's just attracted one person to another. That's this word. That's this idea. And man has no resistance to it except the wisdom of God. The Proverbs declare, don't participate. And avoid the company who like to talk about others. Here's wisdom from the Apostle. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29 Let's make this our daily bread. Let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth, but that which is to good use in edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. That's, that's why I'm here. That's why Mark takes the hours out of his own schedule 
a busy executive, to teach because He wants to convey to you the love of Christ and the power of the Word of God. That's the greatest activity of love that He can bring you. To study on and to be proficient in it. Here's nine. The man who weakens the community, that's the one who's slack in his work. A brother of him who destroys. The top line, the phrase work is literally trading mission in the ancient Near Eastern languages. Isn't that interesting? Trading mission. That would be buying, selling, transactions, exchanges, something for something. Work in its broadest definition. That's the idea of the word. Slack. The slack person is the cureless individual who procrastinates, who is indolent in his duties. Our second line presents the consequences. Consequences from the book of consequences. The brother, emphasizing the relationship to the slacker in line one, a companion, a partner, Proverbs 28, 24, same word, who destroys. There it is. And that is in most of our English translations. A companion who destroys. The word destroys used 18 times in the Old Testament, a reference to a person or personality who by acts or activities does not perform one's responsibility. Here in Ancient Israel, it was an agrarian economy. So they didn't work their property, their farm, what the Lord had allotted for them. What did that involve? Their indolence. Well, they didn't take care of their flocks or herds. They didn't plow. They didn't plant. They just were indolent. Slackers. Now this is really a spiritual matter and the apostles address it for us. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, and 7. We are warned by the apostle to keep away from people who lead an undisciplined life. Keep away with keeping not with the traditions that the apostles taught when they went into cities and said, this is our conduct. This is our behavior. This is how we are to live. Those are the traditions that they received from the apostles. It was all for a purpose. Our ministry, said Paul to the Thessalonians. We came and we worked with our hands among you. We never passed a plate. We didn't have a basket. We didn't say, I'm out here on a mission. No, we just came in and worked right there in front of you. You saw it. And there was a reason for it. Not only credibility among the third parties out there that were watching, but that we would not be a burden to the people of God, the church. That's why we do what we do. Now we come to the famous 10 and 11. They are linked by common themes in style. Look at this, both of them. Protection, security, imagery of fortifications. Tower, city, qualified by the words strong and high. The name of the Lord is a strong or fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. This proverb is much like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, really. 
It's a picture of your life and mine as believers. The world and its citizens are always wiser, stronger. They create their own set of rules and expect us to live by them. And they create them on the fly. The believer, who is he? Well, in reality, according to the Scriptures, he's weak. And we know this. In all of our pilgrimage, we, we know that because that's how we learn to trust the Lord. In everything, He takes us on high mountains and He takes us into dark valleys. I have a dear friend right now whose business is being extorted by Russians through the internet. He supplies information for banks and they have come in and contaminated his software. They want $400,000. And he refuses. And now they're releasing the information. He told me this past week, he said, I have been on my face before the Lord like never before. I said, I'm with you. You don't see me, but I'm with you right there. That's what the proverb tells us. Look at this. Here it opens with the name. That's a, not a label of identification, but rather it's a character description. In other words, think of a dark room and suddenly the spotlight comes on this word, name. That's the idea. It's the fulcrum. It's the focal point of the proverb. The name. And look, it's Lord. What is that? That's the covenant name. The voice. The voice of the burning bush. From the verb to be. I am that I am. You can't explain me. You can't define me. Self-existent, self-sufficient, sovereign, free. What are those? Well, we understand the definitions, but we don't relate to them. They're something totally other than the human experience. They are called uncommunicable attributes. Whereas communicable attributes are like love and jealousy. We relate to them. I'm a jealous God. I understand. But not these. And they're all tied up in that name. And that's the key to the proverb. See, if you know all of these things about this name, well, then you can close your Bible and go home. You've passed the class with an A. But if you really don't know all of these things, then we have an analogy. We have an illustration. Look at this. Strong, fortified tower. The word tower is found in 1 Chronicles 27.25. It's really a storehouse for food. That's what these ancient towers were. Supplies of weaponry. And by its strength, it was built right into the wall of a city, the ancient city. Firmly fixed. Immu immovable. And so under attack, this is the place called the stronghold. In Judges chapter 9 and verse 46. The phrase that is firmly fixed, that's this place. Now, think about this. The image of the tower, it was used in the ancient world for fortifications, traditionally with all kinds of things. Food? Weaponry? Whatever the city would need if it were under siege. That's what these ancient towers and storage houses were about. Now this to me makes the proverb so interesting. Because going back to this undefinable name, we've often said in the past, you want to know that name? Well, here it is. 
from the verb to be. It's the magician's hat. Reach into the hat. Here's a rabbit. Here's a scarf. Here's whatever. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And we go, my gosh, look at all the things in that hat. That's the name. That's this name. As believers, we say to one another, now is the time we have to trust the Lord. Don't we? What is that? What does that mean? What, it, what does that mean? Now is the time to trust the Lord. It means that that name is an endless variety of whatever you and I need. That's the name. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon Me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor Me. That's the name. David cries out, Psalm 54, 1. Save me, O God, by Your name. And what is that name? Well, here's the name. He's a constant remedy in times of trouble. What is it that you need? A rabbit? A scarf? Back in Oklahoma City, I have a family that's broken. Father dead. What do they need? They need comfort out of that name. I have my friend whose business is in peril. What does he need? He needs a wall of protection. What is it you need? Tell me what you need. It's in this name. He is a mighty tower. And all of that sets the stage for the second line. Look, the righteous who are by nature weak. That's precisely what the Apostle tells us about our own nature. You know, 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly and despised things of the world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Okay? So now we know we're weak. Okay? So, what's next? Look at your proverb. Run. Let's define that. Move quickly. Rapidly. Decisively. With all diligence. I can remember being invited. It was either the first or second season of the Texas Rangers. Somebody invited me. And we sat in the outfield and right down the first base line. And there I saw somebody on the field that I'd never heard of. But I never forgot him after that point. The Rangers were playing that day the Oakland A's. And the player that I had never heard of was a man by the name of Reggie Jackson. He became very famous. The World Series, 1977. Three pitches... Three home runs, and the Yankees win the pennant. Mr. October. But on this day, he played for the Oakland A's. And he didn't do anything spectacular. Four ground balls. Four ground balls. Thrown out every time. But it was watching him run that I have never forgotten. He left that batter's box and he flung his body with those legs down the first baseline, helmet flying off every time. And he was reaching. He was a wild man. I've never seen anything like it. The way he could run. And when he would come up to the plate, everybody watching the Rangers were all astir when he came to the plate simply because of the way he ran. 
He was a man possessed. Now, let's look at this. What does the proverb tell us? The righteous are weak, but they run. So when you ask me, will you pray for me? You know what I'm doing? I'm just running right next to you. And when you need encouragement from me, you know what I'm doing? I'm running right next to you. That's what we're doing. We're running it together. That's what we're about. We run because we know we're helpless, but we know where our help comes from. It comes from the one who has, well, he has a thousand keys to open a thousand doors. That's this name. And that's the Word. And here's the way it ends. Protected. Safe. This is literally to be very high. You see, if you're in imminent danger, what you need is to be in a high place. So let's run to it together. And there we're going to find our provision. What is it that you need? Come tell me. I'll run with you this morning. And I'll run with you tomorrow and the next day until God solves that need. Whatever it is, He is. That's the point of the proverb. As a nation, what the righteous need is a high tower place to run. We have it. It's not in our institutions. It's not in personalities. It's in Him. The One who was and is and is to come. Here's the way Paul describes it for you and me. 2 Corinthians. You know the hardships that we endured, he said, in southern Asia. Well, we don't know. Nobody's been able to find out. They were obviously there. And by the Holy Spirit, left for us a blank. Because we don't know. But here's what Paul said. We were beyond our ability as human beings to set ourselves free. We said, this is it. We're, we're, we're in the Alamo, boys, and we're down to nine. And here they come. Now, beyond our ability to save ourselves, and that's when God stepped in. And these things happened, said the Apostle, that we might learn. Oh, the great Apostle, you see, he had to learn. That's why we have these ups and downs, these dark valleys, these twists and turns in life. We're learning. And so we learned not to trust in ourselves, but in God who their situation was so dire and desperate, they considered themselves dead men and now resurrected from the dead alive. Because God had so much more to give through the Apostle to us. You see, he's, every time you pick up the page of Scripture, God had in His plan, I'm going to deliver Him because He's going to write this book and this book and this book and it's going to encourage my church for centuries. You have no idea why God is taking you through the things that He's taking you through. But it's for your good it's for my good. And it is for the benefit of the glory of God. And that's the purpose for living. Will you run this morning? Will you run to the name that can meet every need, whatever that need can be? Come on now. 
It's time that we really trust the Lord here. Will you do that? May God give us the grace. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this Word this morning. It refreshes us. It encourages us. It builds us up because that's what Your Word does. It, uh, it strengthens us in the inner man. It is not, it is not hype and... Per, uh, it is not salesmanship or gamesmanship. It is Your eternal Word that goes forth from Your mouth and never returns void, always effectively accomplishing Your purpose. So do Your Word and Your work. And we'll run, Lord. We'll run. We'll run. Because that's what the righteous do in weakness. In Jesus' name, Amen.